Uh, but yeah, we'll, we'll catch up after. All right, so uh, uh, welcome everybody. My name is Jillian Morris. I'm the founder of Sharks for Kids and we're so excited uh, to be back for another awesome shark webinar. And today's guest I'm really excited about because not only does he have some really incredible um, research, really important research to talk to you about, um, he's also a dear friend of ours. Um, and so we've gotten to see his journey of, of doing all this incredible work. Um, so yeah, without further ado, today's guest is Diego Cardenosa. Uh, he is based in Colombia and his research right now is focusing on the fin trade and some of the challenges. Um, you guys have probably heard people talk about shark finning and the fin trade and fin bands. There's a lot of terms there um, and they're all very, very different. They're connected, but they're different aspects to them. And today he's gonna talk about his research um, he's currently uh, doing his PhD at FIU and is it still Stony Brook or a bit of both? Stony Stony Brook. Stony Brook. Okay. Um, and so, yeah, so he's going to talk about this work and uh, why it's actually, you know, this is so relevant and it's really, really important for shark conservation on the whole. So uh, thank you so much for joining us and thank you to the, all the guests. Just a reminder, type your questions in the Q&A. Um, and we'll get to some of those at the end. So I'm gonna let you take over, Diego. Thank you so much. All right, thank you for having me. And thanks for everybody joining um, this webinar. So yeah, like Gillian said too, I'm gonna show you a little bit of my research on the shark fin trade and, and different ways that we have been using in the last five years to fill in the gaps um, of knowledge and information and we didn't have before we started this, this study. So let's go into the presentation and it's gonna be based on DNA. Um, so I guess some of you are making, I don't know, scary faces right now. I would have, uh, if I was you back in the day when I was in, in college and, and even high school and mid, mid school, um, I hated DNA. I hated everything that had to do with, uh, with genetics or molecular stuff. I almost failed biology a few times just because the whole curriculum was based on, on DNA. Um, even in, in my university years, I, I almost failed also genetics because I feel like nobody showed me what, what DNA was presented in an FAO report back in 2015. This map does not represent all the countries that trade in fins, but basically show you the, ma the major trends. And you can see some of those arrows or the majority of those arrows end up in Southeast Asia, mostly in Hong Kong and China, which are the major consumers of shark fins and the major importers of shark fins. When you look at the shark meat trade, you can see everything is flipped and most of the arrows go towards South America, which is the region in the world with the largest shark meat consumption, especially Brazil, I think. In this FAO report, they estimate that 80% of the shark meat is consumed in Brazil. So it's, it's the meat and the, and the fins get to different places and regions in the world. So you might be wondering who does regulate this and whether it's regulated whatsoever. So yes, the, the, the answer, the short answer is yes, there is a body that regulates the trade in endangered species. It's called CITES, which is the Convention on International Trade in Endangered Species. So it's, it was established in 1973. And every three years, the parties, which up to date, I think are 183 uh, countries or parties that go to these uh, meetings and then they list species either in appendix one or appendix two. Appendix one species are species that are completely banned from all commercial trade in the world. And appendix two species can still be traded, but you have to have, as a country, you have to have permits that regulate and certify that the catch was sustainable, the trade is traceable and the specimens were legally caught. So here in this graph, we have, for example, the pangolin, which is this like scaled mammal in the middle of the screen. That animal is the most trafficked mammal in the world, uh, is critically endangered and is likely the reason that we're all locked, locked down right now in our houses. Um, some scientists have, um, th there's a hypothesis that the, the host of the coronavirus that it's you know currently causing this um, 
came from the pangolins uh, in the pangolin trade, obviously. And then in this graph, we also have mobile arrays and thresher sharks. Those are appendix two species. That means that countries can still trade them, but they need these uh, required permits. So this is a, a graph or a table with all the species that are currently on CITES appendix two of sharks. We are only missing the makos, the short fin mako and the long fin mako that were listed in appendix two in, nine, in 2019 last year. Um, when the fins of these ID species or all species arrive to Hong Kong, they, use, they do it in long and super big uh, containers. They, they came in these and they, they come in these bags uh, dried and unprocessed. That means the skin and, and some of the muscle of the fin is still, is still there. This video was taken during inspections that I did in 2018 with the customs authorities in Hong Kong that we were trying to get uh, and to identify some of those sites, these the species in the containers. And I'm gonna explain a little bit to you uh, further along. So after the, after the fins arrive to China, Hong Kong or China, those fins are processed. That means the, the skin is removed, all the cartilage at the base and everything is removed. So you only have the ceratotrichia, which is what makes the fin. Uh, it's just a bunch of little filaments. You can see here, a lot of the fins are in one of these um, retail markets in Hong Kong. But once you see these fins in the, in, in the picture, you don't know what species are there, if there's blue sharks or hammerheads or, and how many, what proportions are those species in the trade. So that was kind of like the, one of the main goals of, of our study. So there were some unanswered questions before about the fin trade. How many species are being traded? Um, are we seeing any expected results from international trade regulations? So are, are these species that are on CITES, for example, are they very common in the trade? Has there been any change through time since they were listed? Um, and also where do those fins come from? The traceability in the shark fin trade is very, very low. So we cannot get just a container and know where that shark was caught. Um, so that's kind of like very important information that we didn't have before and we still don't have for most species. So another challenge that was presented to us is that the fins are very, very expensive in the, in the markets in, in Southeast Asia. So we found out a different way to study them. And you can see down in the bottom picture, those are some kind of like shark fin trimmings. So when the fin is processed, they cut the base and they cut the, the fin here and there to make it look better. And then they collect those trimmings and sell them very cheap actually in, in the market. So we can collect those trimmings and that way use it as a proxy to see what's on the shelf. So we, we did that and we also, um, while I was doing the inspections in 2018 with, with the customs authorities in Hong Kong, I realized that a lot of those containers were coming with super big sacks full of small things. They were the tiniest, tiniest fins I've ever seen in my life. So I was wondering if I could find those fins in the markets to see what the species composition was um, for those small fins. And we actually found them. That fin, um, that has a pipette tip. It's four centimeters long for your, um, kind of like for reference of size. That means that fin is not much longer than four centimeters. And it came from a scallop hammerhead. So that, definitely was a juvenile shark that ended up in the fin trade. So what we do is we go into the DNA of, of these processed fins and we get a very small portion of the DNA that can tell us what the, the species is for that fin. So we do a different kind of process in the, in the lab. It's called polymerase chain reaction or PCR. I'm not gonna go into the details of, of how it works, but basically we can go and look into a piece of the DNA of the shark that tells us what it is. The DNA is basically just the code. Um, and it's, you can, you can uh, understand it as a code of letters, A, C, G, and T. There are different base pairs in the DNA. And the combination and the order that those, that those letters are in the DNA is what gets translated into proteins and what can tell us what the species is. So here, for example, we have a, a figure that show us a small portion of DNA from a bull shark, a Galapagos shark, a pelagic thresher, and a smooth hammerhead. And you can 
see that there are differences between the sequences. If the, if the sequence was exactly the same and there were no differences, we couldn't tell between the four species, but you can see there that some of the species have A's or C's or T's that the other ones do not have. And that makes a specific code for that species. We can read it and we can identify it in that way. We've analyzed so far almost 10,000, but I'm going to present the, the results here from 2014 and 2017. So we have 9,200 samples analyzed from the shark in trade that were collected through four years. The main results of the survey was that there are around 82 species in the fin trade currently. Uh, just 10 species, the top 10 species, make up 80, 80, 78 percent of the samples. That means the fin trade is biased towards a small subsample of species. Uh, most of those are large pelagic sharks, such as the blue shark. Here we have a beautiful picture of a blue shark. Is the most caught species in the world, the most traded. Thankfully, it's a species that is more productive than most shark species. So it can withstand high pressures of, of um, high fishing pressures, but there's not really uh, an idea for how long are they going to resist this um, massive exploitation that we're doing on them. So the other result we had is that these sites, these species that I was talking about before are very common in the fin trade. For example, here is a picture of a silky shark, which is vulnerable based on the IUCN red list of threatened species, and is the second most common species that we found in the fin markets. Then we have the scalloped hammerhead, which was currently uplisted as critically endangered, and is the third most common in the, in the markets in China and the fourth more, most common in the markets in Hong Kong. Then we have here the smooth hammerhead, also a vulnerable species, the fourth more, most common in Hong Kong, the, in China, and the fifth most common in Hong Kong. So you can see that a lot of these species that are right there at the top of the fin trade are threatened with extinction, unfortunately. Then we, when I started a survey of these small fins that I was telling you about, the scalloped and smooth hammerhead were the second and third most common species. That means we're getting them in their nurseries. And we are also getting their large, the large sharks, but we're also getting the smaller sharks. So we're hitting them in both, in both uh, sides of, the, of their life history, let's say. So that's quite scary for these species because they're really, really threatened. We also find 35 species in 750 samples in this uh, small shark fin category. A third were uh, threatened with extinction. But the species composition was very different. These, most of these 93.1% were coastal species, most likely uh, caught in uh, multi-species uh, fisheries, um, small, small, scale, small scale fisheries around the world probably. Um, while in the survey of the fin trimming, we were looking more at pelagic sharks. So both ways of studying the fin trade is telling us two different, two different stories. So one of, the, one of the questions that we had after, after the results came from the surveys is, how can we detect the cytosist species um, at the border? Like how can we enhance the capacity of the countries to enforce uh, these regulations um, in international trade? So this is a graph of something called real-time PCR. I don't know if you've seen graphs similar to this one in the news recently, because this technique that we're using to identify shark species at the border is exactly the same type of technique that is being used to diagnose the coronavirus. So um, when we test the fins at the border with a machine and, and, the, and a protocol that I'm gonna show you in a second, if it give us this kind of curve, that means that we do have one of the cited list species in our sampling, if we see a, a flat curve, a flat line like the like the black one, that means that that uh, fin was most likely not a site listed species. So it takes around three hours, so it's very um, effective when it comes to to uh, DNA techniques. It's also less than a one US dollar per sample, so it removes a lot of the 
normal steps taken for DNA barcoding. Um, it's very cheap, it's very fast. And um, we can do it as a mobile lab. So we can take this machine and this protocol and put it right there when they're um, sampling and inspecting the, the containers. And then that kind of like optimizes the inspection capacity by, by customs authorities around the world. So this is a picture of of the, let's say the hardware that we use is um, a real-time PCR machine, which is the, the white one right there. It has a computer and then just some com lab consumable, consumables like um, pipette tips and some reagents. And then when the fins arrive to Hong Kong, as I said, they, they came, they come in the, in the containers, a lot of sacks. I remember inspecting containers that had over 14 tons of shark fins, and there was just one container. Each of those sacks is inspected, around 10% of the sack is inspected to see if we can find out with visual cues. Um, if we suspect that there are side infested species in those sacks, every single sack also goes through an X-ray machine uh, to make sure, I guess, they're not smuggling anything within the, within the fins. Then this is a video that is gonna explain to you a little bit why did we did this protocol and how it's helping us to, to increase the, the inspection capacity of the countries and how this is serving conservation? So when we run the, the PCR, the real-time PCR, and we're waiting for those two and a half hours to go um, and give us the results, this is basically how it looks like. So at the end of the, of the cycles, which are 40, you'll see some of the curves coming up. And that means there's a positive result for sighted list species. If the line keeps on a straight, on a straight tra trajectory, that means it's a non sighted species. After that, which you, you have a positive or negative result, you can also have different curves that tell you which species is it. Is it a silky shark? Is it a hammerhead? Is it a thresher shark? So just reading, just reading these curves will allow you to identify which species are you looking at and which one is being illegally traded. This work has led to over a ton of shark fins being uh, confiscated by Hong Kong authorities um, at the moment. And we also adapted this tool to identify smuggling of European eels, which is uh, also a critically endangered species. And before we, before we designed these techniques, they could only confiscate the, um, the shipment, let's say, and the smuggler was allowed to go, to go and just take a plane and leave. Um, they could not prosecute the smuggler because they couldn't have any quick identification whether the eel that they were seeing was European or was a different species. Um, so we designed a similar tool for European eels and we actually caught smugglers trafficking European 
it led to the first prosecution of eel smugglers in Hong Kong in history. So these tools can be very, very useful to create deterrence for illegal traffickers of wildlife. So, so far, we already know how many species are being traded or we have a very clear um, picture of it. Probably we're missing a few species that are quite rare. Uh, we're still conducting these this study and we're going to keep going um, in the in the future. So so we're going to have a very, very clear um, number of how many species are being traded as we as we go along. Also, um, we know that sighted species are still being very, very common in the shark fin trade and that that give us an idea that higher enforcement by by uh, sighted parties parties are is needed. But then the, the next question is, where are those fins coming from? And here DNA is also very, very useful. I'm going to give you an idea of how it works uh, with an example on the pelagic thresher shark, one of the most amazing um, species of, of shark. Uh, to me, at least, look at this, those fins and that tail. It's amazing. They use that tail to uh, hunt, actually. Um, and if you thought the great white was cool for breaching, here is a picture of a, of a thresher shark that was Taking recently, I think in Costa Rica, of a thresher shark just leaping out of the water very, very high, which is amazing. So this, this species of, of thresher shark lives in the Pacific Ocean and the Indian Ocean. And the shaded, the shaded um, parts in colors that you can see here are the different regional fisheries management organizations that operate in those, in those places. So IOTC means the Indian Ocean Tuna Commission. WCPFT is the Western Central Pacific Fisheries Commission, if I'm not mistaken. Um, and IATTC is the Inter-American Tropical Tuna Commission. So those RFMOs have different regulations. Some can ban the retention of, of shark species. For example, the thresher shark is banned in retention in the Indian Ocean. So we wanted to know back in 2014 when I did my master's what the structure of the stock or the population in the in the Pacific Ocean was for these species. So we collected samples in Taiwan, Hawaii, South California, Baja California, Clipperton Islands, Costa Rica, Colombia, and Ecuador to have a good sampling throughout the whole ocean basin and see if it was just one single population across the Pacific Ocean, or it was different kind of populations. What we found is actually there is a very clear separation in the Central Pacific that separates the Western Pacific from the Eastern Pacific. Those differences between the populations can be tracked in the DNA, and then we can use that information to get things from pressure sharks in the, um, in the markets in Hong Kong and China and try to assign them to a different population. So we can actually know where in the world are, being this, are these species being caught. So that's quite important because it can lead either to uh, global uh, regulations of fishing for those species, regional, uh, for example, here, if most of the thresher sharks are caught in the Eastern Pacific, that falls into the jurisdiction of IATTC. So it could lead to regional fisheries uh, management for, for that species. And for some species that are not as highly migratory as the, as the pelagic thresher, we can actually try to narrow down the geographic scale and come up with ways to see, for example, which uh, nursery areas are being targeted for scalp hammerhead. So, we're doing this at the moment with the silky shark. Um, the silky shark population structure shows us that there are two different clades or populations. One is the Indo-Pacific. So at the moment, we cannot distinguish between a shark that was caught in the Indian Ocean or the Pacific Ocean, but we can differentiate it from Indo-Pacific sharks to Atlantic sharks. So we can know whether the silky sharks in the trade are coming from the Atlantic or the rest of the world. For the pelagic thresher, we can know if it comes from the Eastern Pacific or the Western Pacific and Indian Ocean, which is the same population. And we're also doing it, like I said, for scallop hammerheads um, in nursery areas. We're trying to see if we can pinpoint the regions or the country 
in the nursery being uh, they are contributing the majority of those things to the fin trade. And that would hopefully lead to um, local regulation and some sort of like protected areas or protected nurseries for for these species, which is critically endangered. endangered. And if we don't do anything quick, um, they're gonna go quite, quite fast in our lifetimes. So I think that's it for now. Um, I'll just have questions and I'll answer your questions if you have any. Great, thank you so much. And I think this is this is just really relevant talking about the animal trade because that's obviously a hot topic right now, not just with sharks, but also wildlife trade in general. So um, it just shows you really, I think the focus on this kind of research um, why it's so important and why it's it's necessary to police these laws. Um, yeah, these, these tools that I showed you, they can be applied to any any species in the world. I'm actually working right now on uh, illegal trading some sort of freshwater turtle that is endemic to South America. But then usually they they confiscate them live. If they're being trafficked for the for the pet trade. But then for the reintroduction, they need to know where do they come from, and they need to know it. They need to know that fast, so they don't keep those um, turtles in captivity for too long because mortality is quite high in captivity. So we're uh, developing tools to do this quickly, as quickly as three and four hours, to identify where those um, turtles are coming from and get them back to the wild as soon as we can. Great. All right, so um, the first question, which is uh, probably our most common one, is what is your favorite shark? Do you have one? Um, yeah, I have two. One, as I said, is the pelagic thresher is amazing. Uh, and also the oceanic white tip. It's always been um, one of my favorites. Very cool. Um, all right, so Daniel asked, when did you get interested in studying sharks? And then when did you get like, and studying the fins? When did that kind of come? What, what got you interested in that? Um, well, in sharks, like since I remember, uh, <laughs> I, always, I always wanted to be a biologist. I always wanted to become a shark scientist. Um, in terms of my career track, let's say, I didn't start directly into sharks or directly into marine biology. I tried to do biology first because, well, it's, it's science. And the, the more you know in a broad scale is the better. And then you can start narrowing down uh, as, as you go along to what, what you like. What I liked the most was applied conservation. Um, so any tools that I can use to create uh, change and create you know, positive positive effects on, on the status of shark population. That's kind of like what drives my attention. And I started with the fin trade back in 2015 when I started my PhD. Uh, I showed you the results of my master's degree, which was in 2012 to 2014. Um, so, so yeah, I've, I've been just trying to, to find different projects and find different ways that I can that I can have a positive change in, for sharks. It doesn't have to be fin trade. If you're interested in sharks, you can go a lot of different ways to, you know, to make a change for sure. Very cool. All right. Um, so since it sounds like you guys are creating these tools, um, you know, or creating a use for them, you're not, the tools are being used, as you said, like with the yeah. current uh, situation with COVID, but, um, has that made the research a little bit more challenging just because it's not a method that's been really applied to this before? So you're sort of developing the, the user manual, if you will. Yes, we're developing the user manual for sharks, but these techniques have been there for, for a long, long time. So they're quite standardized. So that actually makes it easier. We don't have to come up with like create reagents or anything like that. We just have to create uh, something called primers, which which is what in the process of the PCR detects what region of the DNA are you looking for. So that's kind of like what we need to go into the DNA. But the rest of the tool has been there for for microbiology and, and me medicinal region uh, um, reasons uh, and applications. So we're just kind of like tweaking something that was already developed and was already created to benefit sharks, but we, we did not obviously invented real-time PCR or anything like that. It's amazing. I think 
uh, as some of these talks we've talked about you know technology that exists that might have not been used for sharks or thought of using and then when you actually combine them whether it's engineering or this sort of genetic work or, and dna analysis it's amazing what it can actually do even though maybe it wasn't thought of to be used for that purpose before right sometimes uh, we need to go to different techniques or different fields of research and science and see how can we apply all the different things that other people are doing let's say in medicine or just forensics for example to be applied in the in in, in shark conservation so yeah, it's a, it's a very multidisciplinary uh, way of, of doing research. Um, has this method reduced the trade of species, of CITES listed species? That's from Alicia. So I guess my, my answer would be no, uh, because it was just very recently developed. So what needs to happen now is that more countries use it, so we can create enough deterrent and enough um, capacity of detecting this illegal trade. So, so yeah, as, as of today, I wouldn't say that the technique has created a significantly uh, reduction of the trade in these species, but that's where we're aiming for. And it would only happen if these tools are applied widely in the world and also if they get translated into higher uh, penalties, I would say, um, if you if you detect the trade and you go and 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 give the the trafficker, the trader, or the smuggler very small penalties, that would not create sufficient deterrent for the trade to stop. So these tools are awesome and they they can be highly useful, but if they don't come up with stronger law enforcement and and penalties, I don't think they're gonna do much of a, of a difference. Yeah, it's it's like anything. And with shark sanctuaries, MPAs, there's these amazing laws and tools, but if they aren't utilized and aren't policed, then how, how and even CITES listings and, and conservation listings and ESA and things like that, if they're not policed or enforced, it's, it's yeah, it's not an effective tool. So yeah. yeah like, so I guess I guess we can we can develop all these tools and we can come up with different ways of detecting this. But if the countries don't treat wildlife trafficking in a serious way and and make it look like a very very serious crime, which it is, um, then I don't think we're gonna get anywhere really. Um, Mariana wants to know, which is kind of what we just you mentioned, is will the wildlife traffic ban in China? currently because of, of COVID-19 benefit shark conservation? Um, not really. Um, unfortunately, that wildlife traffic ban or wildlife trade ban was only um, developed for life trade and terrestrial animals. So, so aquatic species, especially shark fins, they wouldn't fall into that ban. So as of today, that wouldn't, it's not creating any positive or any kind of impact on, on the shark trade. Right. Let's see. Um, what can I do to help with this particular issue is we've actually had that asked um, by a couple of people on, on the chat, like regarding just um, sort of your research or the fin trade in, in general. What do you think, what would you recommend or some advice you would give people? Um, that's that's a tough one um i feel like as a general public the best way um if you're not into let's say if, if you're into research and you're a scientist i would say create knowledge and create information that policy makers and law enforcement can can use to um and, and apply it to shark conservation but if you're part of the general public i would say just educate yourself um, and try to come up with ways, if you eat seafood, for example, try to come up with ways to identify whether, whether the species or the product you're consuming uh, had any impact on, on sharks as bycatch or, or anything like that, that would create uh, some, some difference. Um, try to... Yeah, to vote for example i think i think we sometimes miss or or don't don't understand like our vote has a, has a very good impact or can have a very very good impact on 
on conservation. So to try to vote for people that have a specific laws against against wildlife crime, against wildlife trade, and, and have positive um, laws and, and ideas for, for the conservation of nature. Yeah, it's I think a lot of this is it's kind of there isn't always an obvious answer, right? It's yeah. there's a lot of challenges and that's why we're in the situation with so many animals is because it's it's not so cut and dry. It's not always a black and white answer. Um, there's a lot of challenges and and depending on location and state and country. I mean, there's you, you know, that really adds to the mix. It's not one simple um, answer. One size fits all for everybody. Yeah, I mean, if you if you're somebody that consumes shark fin soup or shark meat, I would say, don't do it, and that would have a good a good um, a good impact, let's say. But but if you don't, then then you have to come up with different ways to to have an impact and, and voting for for candidates that care of our environment might be a good a good way to start doing it. Yeah, um, and somebody asked. So you mentioned that blue sharks are the most common. Uh, but is there a shark that its fin is the most famous or most sought after? Yeah, actually, the fin that is the most expensive is not even from a shark, it's from a ray. Uh, so we have the wedge and guitar fishes. Those, those fins are not too common uh, in the trade, but they're, also, they're definitely some of the ones that fetch the highest prices. They can be uh, almost up to a thousand US dollars per kilogram um so that's quite quite expensive but also well yeah the situs listed species are some of the species that fetch the highest prices for their fins so hammerheads and silky sharks they do have and the oceanic white tip they have very very uh expensive fins too that's what they they are highly highly threatened um what was the first shark you ever saw <laughs> it was a nurse shark <laughs> mine too <laughs> yeah uh, uh, well, one of the most common, I'm from Colombia. Uh, my first dive actually was in, in the Caribbean Sea and, and those that, that species is very common. So yeah, I remember it was a very, very small and cute nurse. I'm just letting people know that you're answering their questions. All right. Now this one is also um, a little bit tricky to answer, I think, but how will the recent ban on shark product trade in Florida affect the product trade in the US? Because obviously it's not every state. Right, uh, fin bands are, are a, a, tricky, a tricky thing. Um, as I showed you, let's talk about the federal uh, shark fin ban that is being proposed at the moment. Um, it will cover Florida for sure. If you ban the fins in the US, so you're not allowed to possess them or trade them, I feel any regulation that we do for sharks has to be um, translated or has to have a positive effect on reducing the shark mortality. If you create a regulation that does not get translated into reduced number of sharks being killed, it's a regulation that is not really useful. So I feel like with the shark fin trade, the shark fin ban in the US, Sharks will still be caught in the U.S. Uh, the meat, the meat value of the of shark meat value in the U.S. is quite high, um, and as I said, sharks get get caught in a lot of different ways in a different fishery. So, not necessarily by banning the fins, you're gonna reduce the shark mortality. I feel like if we want to do it and we want to create um, really a, a positive change for sharks in the water that has to be through fisheries management regulations not just blanket bans but we have to find out um, quotas and, and and do stock assessments and really get deep into the science of fisheries so we can so we can uh, have a better management of the fisheries because it's unrealistic that less sharks are going to be killed just by banning things um. Do you enjoy this research? Is it fun? Oh yeah, <laughs> it's super fun. So I don't know, like if you, it depends on what you like and what your goals are, I guess. Like I feel for most of us that are into shark research, we would love to be in the water with sharks all the time. 
and you know like be close to sharks that's why we do it because we love them. but most of the time that's not the fastest and most effective way to create a change like most of the time for the last five years of my life i've spent it in a very very small lab in hong kong uh very far from any live shark but at the same time, I always had in my mind that it was for a reason and the results and the, and the research that I was doing was going to create a change. So, yeah, sometimes when I'm in the lab, after extracting and running thousands and thousands of samples, it can get a little either, frust I wouldn't say frustrated, but boring sometimes. But you always have to keep in mind while you're doing stuff. So um, it's, it's been a great, a great journey. Yeah, I don't have any complaints whatsoever and sometimes when i really need shark action i try to go and visit jillian and she she gets me closer to the sharks and that kind of recharges me every now and then yeah it's i think a lot of people would say that is the swimming with sharks is the fun part and seeing live sharks and i know i'm lucky i spent a lot more time with live sharks yeah. um and and that does recharge you but it's it's the work on the back end, it's in the lab, it's on the computer, it's networking, it's writing, it's communication. So, you know, for those of you who are interested in, in science, um, yeah, you see photos of people swimming with sharks and that might be part of it, but what you don't see is the months to get the permits, the funding, the equipment, the prep for the trip. There's a lot more that goes into it. Um, and it's not just the Instagram photos that you see of, of everybody swimming with sharks. It's all the work that leads up to those moments um, but they definitely do recharge us. And I'm sure for you, it's uh, the conservation work can be really um, frustrating, sad, uh, you know, it, it, a lot of emotions. Um, and so, too sometimes. Yeah. Sure. And so to have that, I think to get in the water and remember why you're going through all of this, why you're facing the challenges, why you're working so hard and dedication, dedicating so much of your time. Um, yeah, I think that's, that's, it's a really important to kind of have that that refresh that recharge yeah i always try to have some some projects in my let's say in my research that gets me to the field because definitely a remembering of why we go through all this trouble but most of my time i either spend it in the lab on the computer writing or or just traveling to different places to show these protocols to convince uh countries to to use them Thing. All right. Um, another question was, do you only work uh, in Hong Kong or China with the Finns? Or are you, and you kind of just talked about that. Do you travel? We'll just do two more questions. So this is one of them. Um, do you travel to other locations, other projects to work with, um, you know, different, not just the Finn focus? Yeah. So a lot of, like I said, a lot of the, of the research was focused on Hong Kong and in China. I actually moved to Hong Kong for a full year in 2018. But I also have projects in Guyana uh, with shark fishermen and shark fisheries there. I have projects. One of the ones that um, kind of like is my recharging port is uh, is here in Colombia on the in the Caribbean Sea. There's a there's an MPA or like a, a reserve called the Sea Flower Biosphere Reserve. is a is very unknown to most people, but it's 180 thousand square kilometers. Um, it has different atolls and different reefs that are quite isolated by a lot of um, open ocean. And we're starting to research there and we found that we actually have the highest abundance of reef sharks in the Caribbean Sea in that plate. So it's, it's very sharky, it's quite amazing. We have oceanic white tips, great hammerheads, makos, um, nurse sharks, Caribbean reef sharks, tiger sharks. There's a lot of different species there. So we're starting to come up with an index of the abundance of the true abundance in that area. And it's showing us that it's as high or even higher in most places than Bahamas. So it's quite, it's quite an interesting place to, to do research. Cool. And I'm just gonna find one last one. You guys, these have been great questions and yeah, it's, it's really, really um, interesting. What advice, and this is one that we've seen a few times and usually get, um, what advice would you get give to someone who wants to get into studying sharks, shark research, or even a similar project to your what you're doing? Um, study. <laughs> 
definitely like a lot of people think this is just go and you know jump in the water with a shark but it is definitely if you want to have like an impact and you want to make a career out of this you have to study you have to put in the time um, i remember being a little frustrated actually when i was in pursuing my bachelor's degree in biology uh, because i had to see a lot of math a lot of physics a lot of chemistry that didn't have anything to do with sharks whatsoever but you always have to remember there is a way to create knowledge and teach your brain how to think scientifically and then you can start narrowing down to whatever you like whether it's sharks or anything else but but um i think educating yourself and, and really putting the time uh on your education would be the best way to pursue a career and end up doing research like i do or like uh chris Lowe does he was showing us yesterday amazing research uh here um and most of the people that have been on these webinars are people that have dedicated actually most of their lives just studying, reading, writing. Um, so uh, it's, it, I think that's the way to do it. Yeah, I think I always ask when people ask is internships, volunteering, gaming experience, getting in the field. If, if you want to be a field biologist of some sort and you have this degree, but you've never been on a boat or in a lab or um, you know, gone scuba diving, those are things to start thinking about, is to gain that experience. Um, I met Diego when he was at the Bimini Shark Lab, amazing opportunities for students to come through, volunteer, learn how to catch sharks, tag them, drive boats, just really participate in a wide range of, of research projects and field skills because it, it looks interesting and glamorous, but it's not always glamorous. It's long days, rough weather, people get sick, you get injured, it's hard work. Um, and so getting in the field and getting that experience beforehand, uh, I think is really, really valuable. And- yeah, uh, But I mean, when I said education, I just didn't mean go into a classroom. I feel like one of the, of the moments in my life where I learned the most was when I was in the shark lab in Bimini. So, that was part of my education. It was just not academic, but it was field education. Yeah. But whether it's in the field or in the academia or on a book or just out in nature, like just try to find a way to learn uh, the more you can. Absolutely. Well, thank you to everyone who joined us. Um, we really appreciate all the wonderful questions. Uh, didn't get to all of them, but if you have something you really want to know, uh, a question that didn't get answered, feel free to reach out through our website. Uh, we have a lot of additional kind of general information on the, the Sharks for Kids website. Um, and special thanks to Diego for spending some time with us today and, oh, and sharing you. this, you know, really relevant and important research. So thank you so much for sharing that with us today. No worries, anytime. Awesome. Thank you guys. Have a great day. Bye-bye.